Now, let's bring on the 1969 Mountaineers. This is it. This is the payoff. All the hard work, sweat, and tears of a tough football season at West Virginia University will culminate in Atlanta, Georgia, home of the second annual Peach Bowl. The Mountaineers, riding high on a 9-1 regular season record, put it all together this year. They racked up the second best record in all the glorious history of Mountaineer football. And now, here comes the payoff. Peach Bowl, 1969. Georgia Governor Lester Maddox welcomes the Mountaineers and their Peach Bowl opponents, the Gamecocks of South Carolina, champions of the Atlantic Coast Conference, sporting a 7-3 record. The Gamecocks and their supporters arrived in force, full of spirit and confidence, ready to show these northern invaders how football ought to be played. And the Mountaineer fans were there too. turned out by the thousands to support their team and cheer the West Virginia University marching band under the direction of Bud Udell. The band won the heart of all Atlantans as it entertained in parades and concerts throughout the city, climaxing a spectacular year of home game performances for the great halftime show at the Peach Bowl. It wasn't all work for the Mountaineer players who made the trip. Defensive tackle George Henshaw, offensive end Jim Smith, and All-American middle guard Carl Crennel, three senior starters, stroll along Peachtree Street during a break in the festivities. There was plenty of time for sightseeing in this historic southern city. The Mountaineers were treated like kings, soaking up all that famous southern hospitality during their five-day stay. One of the highlights of the many Peach Bowl activities was the Potluck Peach Inn. Pop recording stars Billy Joe Royal and the Classic Four entertained the entire WBU team and staff at the Shrine Activities Building. The steak and seafood dinners were delicious, topped off by what else but Georgia peaches. But the Peach Bowl story doesn't start here in Atlanta. It begins back in Morgantown, West Virginia, home of one of America's great academic institutions, West Virginia University. On the Evansdale campus, north of downtown Morgantown, is the new $8 million Creative Arts Center with art, drama, and music under one roof. WVU's $31 million medical center is one of the most modern in the country. More than 2,000 persons are involved in teaching, research, and service in its basic sciences program and in the four schools, medicine, dentistry, nursing, and pharmacy, and the 520-bed university hospital. The university serves more than 19,000 students throughout West Virginia. On the Morgantown campuses, student activity is centered in Mountain Lair, a $7 million center with plaza and parking garage underneath. Mountain Lair facilities include a spacious lounge and game room areas. Pocket billiards and bowling are two of the students' favorites. The university provides housing for 1,800 students in a dormitory complex called the Towers. Here, students enjoy modeling designed with their needs in mind. And this is also where the football team lives, in spacious rooms equipped with large desks, plenty of wardrobe space, comfortable beds, private phones, and how about this sports fans, maid service. It's a good place to study, and it's a good place to relax with friends. But if it's atmosphere you want, take a trip downstairs to the Towers Lounge and join the crowd listening to records around a blazing fireplace. The lounge is a favorite spot for Mountaineer teammates to get together and enjoy some relaxing companionship with the pretty WVU co-eds. The lounge is just one of the many extras built into the Towers for the enjoyment of the students. There are recreation rooms with billiard and ping pong tables, special TV rooms with cafeterias and snack bars nearby libraries and classrooms, as well as several small movie theaters, all located here in the West Virginia University Towers. Football fever was at a high pitch in Morgantown, even before this great season got underway. 
the students and fans rallied around the Mountaineers in preseason thuses, anticipating a good year in 1969. Mountaineers Stadium, decked out in new AstroTurf, was filled to capacity for the opener with Cincinnati. Junior tailback Bob Gresham got the ball rolling immediately with a fine run to the Bearcat 2. On the very next play, guard Ron Cecil recovered a fumble in the end zone, and the Mountaineers were on their way. Defensive specialist Bob Starford and George Henshaw led a vicious West Virginia rush on the passer to set up the Mountaineers' own passing game on the arm of Mike Sherwood, who throws to fullback Jim Braxton for another touchdown. The Mountaineers were already in full command with a 20 to nothing lead. Now the crack defensive unit shows its stuff again as Henshaw throws the beleaguered Bearcat quarterback for a loss. And then cool hand Mike Sherwood, who holds most Mountaineer passing records, it's wingback Wayne Porter with a short pass, and WVU was knocking at the door again. Another short pass to split in Oscar Patrick puts the ball on the four-yard line. Sherwood, who's not afraid to run when he has to, slides into the end zone for another touchdown, which gave the Mountaineers an insurmountable 34 to nothing lead midway in the third period. The underrated defense also got an unusual score in the fourth quarter as B.C. Williams and John Hale lead a rush on the Cincinnati signal caller for a safety and a 50 to 11 scoreboard reading. The last minute WVU score ran the final count to 57 to 11 in this opening day win. The University of Maryland invaded Mountaineer Field the next week under new coach and WVU alumnus Roy Lester. Once again, Gresham starts things going against the Turks when he makes one of his usual exciting runs around the end, 18 yards in all, before being stopped at the nine-yard line. Mr. Inside, fullback Jim Braxton, goes outside this time and scampers the remaining nine yards for the Mountaineers' initial score. The instant replay from ground level shows Braxton's TD run, one of the 12 he scored last season, which helped make him the number eight scorer in the nation. The Burley fullback also booted 24 extra points and three field goals. Sherwood passes to Patrick for 13 yards in the next series of plays, and West Virginia lands on the Maryland three-yard line. Senior tailback Eddie Silverio goes up the middle for the touchdown and a 14 to nothing West Virginia lead. Going to the air again, Sherwood flips a 12 yard scoring strike to Patrick and the Mountaineers go way ahead by 28 to seven in the third quarter. The rain soaked turfs trying to get back but were stopped by the likes of Henshaw, Charlie Fisher and Art Holt time after time for big losses. All-American middle guard Carl Fresnel gets into the defensive act two in the 31-7 WVU win. Tulane at New Orleans was next for the unbeaten Mountaineers. And Gresham again started off with a bang as he makes a twisting 13-yard run to midfield. The junior from Yukon, West Virginia, had one of his best games against the Green Wave, gaining 169 yards in the ground, getting 10 of them on the up-to-the-middle burst like this one. Patrick, who injured his knee against Tulane, grabs a six-yard scoring pass, and WVU takes a 7-0 lead. After Tulane went ahead 10-7, Gresham put the Mountaineers back in front with this touchdown run. Trailing at the half, 17-14, West Virginia goes to Gresham again on a screen pass, and he puts the Mountaineers ahead to stay, 21-17. The versatile tailback sets up another West Virginia score as he dashes 32 yards with a pitch out against a confused Tulane defense. When Tulane threatened in the fourth quarter, Carl Cornell shows his All-American talents by intercepting a crucial pass and the Mountaineers have their third win, 35 to 17. 
Returning to Mountaineer Field, WVU tackles Scrappy VMI. After Braxton put the Mountaineers in the lead three to nothing with a field goal, the nervous cadets fumbled the next kickoff. And Jack Hammond, a member of the West Virginia Specialty Kickoff Team, covered the ball at the 14-yard line. Bruising fullback Braxton wasted no time as he bowled off tackle on the next play for 14 yards and a 10 to nothing WVU lead. Quarterback Mike Sherwood shows his running ability on a keeper as he dashes 17 yards to the BMI 24 yard line. The next call naturally went to Gresham and he scampered 16 more yards and the Mountaineers are again threatening. It wasn't long before Gresham literally dives over the top from one yard out and a 17 to nothing lead. Still in the second quarter, Gresham shows why he's considered All-American material for 1970 as he makes a fantastic 53-yard touchdown run in, around, and out of defenders. The scoring is not all confined to the ground, however, as Sherwood shows with a perfect 40-yard scoring aerial to reserve wingback Robin Kazin. The 32-0 win gave WVU a 4-0 unblemished record. Beaver Stadium. A record crowd of more than 52,000 fans awaited the meeting of the unbeaten at Penn State where the second-ranked Nittany Lions hosted the Mountaineers. West Virginia, behind the fine inside running of fullback Jim Braxton, moved the ball well in the first quarter along the ground against the country's number one defensive team. The Mountaineers had to change their game plan at the last minute and rely on the running of Braxton and Gresham throughout the contest. Oscar Patrick, WVU's fine split end, re-injured his knee minutes before the kickoff, and he had been counted on for numerous pass plays. But West Virginia had to stick to the ground and couldn't quite score on the mighty Penn State defense. The gallant Mountaineers came close, especially in the first half, on runs like this by Braxton and Gresham. Penn State, clinging to a narrow 7-0 halftime lead, threatened the West Virginia goal line. But three straight times in this series, the top WVU defense halts Penn State on the goal line. Penn State eventually pulled away by 20 to nothing. Mountaineer Field was filled to capacity for the homecoming game with arch rival Pitt. The record crowd had hardly settled in its seats when the West Virginia defense led a vicious rush on Pitt's punter, and then John Hale broke through to block the kick. The ball bounded into the end zone, where sophomore safety man Leon Jenkins came out of a scramble to land on it for the Mountaineers' first touchdown. A minute and a half later, Hale charged through again and blocked another punt. This time, it was junior linebacker Dale Farley who covered the ball for West Virginia on the one-yard line to set up the second TD. The defense rose to the occasion again in the first period when defensive halfback Mike Slater intercepted a pit pass in the end zone when it looked like the Panthers might score. Sophomore Eddie Williams came into his own against Pitt as he scrambled for 29 yards and the third WVU score of the half. And then quarterback Mike Sherwood caps the first half scoring with a short touchdown run. Jenkins, having himself a field day in the pit secondary, picks off another Panther misguided aerial and makes a beautiful 31-yard touchdown return, aided by fine blocks from Carl Cornell and Terry Sniper. This score put the Mountaineers way out in front of their northern foe, 35-6.
quarterback Mike Sherwood, perhaps better known for his passing exploits, knows what to do when the receivers are covered. Against a stunned pit defense, he gallops 70 yards on a smart, phenomenal, electrifying run before being chased out of bounds on the three-yard line. Later in the third quarter, the junior from Bel Air, Ohio, takes off again, this time around the end for 24 yards to the pit eight yard line to set up another score. The call then went to Eddie Williams who rambled the final eight yards and West Virginia's 42nd point. The sophomore fullback from Sandusky, Ohio, knew it was a day for long runs, so he took his turn with the pigskin, bursting through the line on a quick opener and galloping 80 yards for the final score of 49 to 18. It was the worst beating for Pitt in the long series, and third year in a row, the Panthers had been tamed. Rain and the Kentucky Wildcats next away to the Mountaineers in Lexington, Kentucky. It was to be a day of defensive heroics for West Virginia. Leon Jenkins picked off one of the six interceptions and returned this one almost scoring. Later in the second quarter, Mike Sherwood hit tight end Jim Smith with a direct pass that gained 14 yards and a first down at the Kentucky Five. And then fullback Jim Braxton got the Mountaineers' only touchdown on the next play as he bowled up the middle for four yards and the score. The all-important extra point placement, which eventually decided the game, was good. When the Wildcats threatened to score in the fourth quarter, Quarterback Mike Slater intercepted his fourth pass of the afternoon, which tied a long-standing WVU record. It killed Kentucky's last opportunity, and West Virginia had its sixth win, a narrow 7-6. Rain greeted the Mountaineers and William and Mary at Williamsburg, too. But it didn't stop West Virginia's passing game as Mike Sherwood hit Jim Smith with an alley-oop touchdown aerial for a quick score, which eventually led to an easy 31-0 WVU win. Sherwood, who threw for 151 yards against the Indians, hit Smith again for 48 yards to set up another Mountaineer score. Two plays later, senior Eddie Silverio scoots around end for the final Mountaineer Tower. The win gave WVU its seventh win in eight starts. Back home against Richmond, the Mountaineers had to fight a snow battle. Bob Gresham got rolling in the second quarter with this fine 27-yard run on the snow-covered AstroTurf. It was only a few plays later when Gresham, displaying more fine running form, dashed his way for a Mountaineer touchdown. Later, defensive tackle Charlie Fisher, a stalwart all year, stops the Richmond quarterback for a seven-yard loss. And that set up another great defensive effort by end Bob Starford, who crashed through the Richmond line and blocked a spider punt at the 31-yard line. Bob Gresham going around the end this time gallops 15 yards for another WVU score and a 19 to nothing lead. Carl Cornell shows his All-American talents by stopping the Richmond quarterback on a bone-crushing tackle. Ron Poblish, the Mountaineers punt return specialist, 
gets his best run back of the year as he takes the ball on the 20, backtracks around one tackler, picks out his blockers, and scampers 80 yards along the sideline for the score that made it 26 to seven in favor of the Mountaineers. Enjoying another great game, Crennell makes another fine tackle in the fourth quarter when he stops the Richmond quarterback and forces a fumble which Charlie Fisher recovers. The final, West Virginia 33, Richmond 21. Archbold Stadium in snow-covered upstate New York. With an 8-1 season record to date, the Mountaineers had already received and accepted a bid to play South Carolina in the Peach Bowl. But their more immediate thoughts concerned oranges and not peaches namely the Syracuse Orange. For only the third time in 10 starts, the Mountaineers found themselves behind in the first half. Syracuse had taken an early 3-0 lead, and despite runs like this by Braxton, West Virginia couldn't score in the first two quarters and fell behind 10-0 at the half. Things began to click in the third period as Sherwood hit Braxton with a 19-yard pass at the Syracuse 36-yard line. Another pass to end Jim Smith was good for 27 yards at the orange seven and West Virginia was threatening. On fourth down at the Syracuse three, Sherwood found Wayne Porter on the goal line and the Mountaineers crept closer at 10 to seven. Within two minutes, lightning struck again on a spectacular razzle-dazzle play which found Sherwood, about to be tackled, lateraling to Braxton, who danced 65 yards along the sidelines for the score which gave West Virginia a 13-10 win over the Orange, the second victory in a row over Syracuse. It seemed almost like a dream, the first postseason bowl game for West Virginia since 1964. The Mountaineers had made it to Atlanta. Bob Gresham didn't waste any time showing the Southern folks how the Mountaineers could move the ball as he sprinted with a pitch out for 23 yards. Eddie Williams, a starter for the first time out of the Mountaineers' new wishbone Y offense, picks up 12 more. After three running plays move the ball to the South Carolina 10, Gresham finds running room in the right end and rambles for the first quarter touchdown and a 7-0 WVU lead. The instant replay from the opposite side of the field shows Gresham's fluid body motion and his smooth running ability in the execution of the perfect touchdown. The Gamecocks threatened immediately, but Carl Cronell jars the ball loose from fullback Bill Muir, and the drive is stopped at the 10. Ed Williams, who gained most valuable offensive player honors in the game, gallops through the mob on the left side for 34 yards. When the Gamecocks got the ball back and moved toward midfield, three great defensive plays stopped the Carolinians. Crennell and Henshaw stop All-American fullback Muir in his tracks. And then Crennell latches on to Rudy Holman, and the South Carolina halfback can go nowhere. When quarterback Tommy Suggs tries to pass his way out, a great Mountaineer rush forces him to ground the ball. Getting the ball right back, the Mountaineers go to Eddie Williams through the left side. Then Williams shows more of his MVP honors as he gallops through the mud on a fantastic long gainer.
South Carolina, trailing by 7-3 in the fourth quarter, goes to the air from the Mountaineer 20-yard line. But Terry Snively, an alert defensive back, picks it off. When West Virginia was forced to punt, the Gamecocks tried to pass again. This time, it was little Ron Povelich who intercepted at the South Carolina 44. ground level, the instant replay camera shows Povelich's defensive instincts as he waits on the ball. Now the Mountaineers weren't to be denied. Eddie Williams bolts to the South Carolina 19-yard line. Williams' run through the left side shows sheer power and great strength. This eight-yard run by Williams gave him 208 yards for the game and a new West Virginia single-game rushing record. Fullback Jim Braxton finally cracks the right side of the line for the final yard and the game's last score. The Mountaineer fans went wild over the 14-3 victory in an almost perfect 10-1 season record. And thus, one era comes to an end and another begins, the Bobby Bowden era at West Virginia University. After selecting his coaching staff, Bobby Bowden held a news conference to outline his football philosophy and his hopes for the future at West Virginia. Now, the first question I was asked when I was appointed head football coach here was, how much is the program going to change? Well, my answer then is not going to change at all. You don't change something good. You don't change a winner. So my answer is still, it's not going to change at all. The personality of the people carrying it out might change, but the program will stay the same. Jim left this program on a real sound foundation, and I intend to keep it the same. I hope that every boy we sign at West Virginia University will eventually graduate. And I hope that through these gentlemen up here today that these boys we turn out will be not only better physically and mentally, but also spiritually. 